So the reading today is from James chapter 1, from verse 26, to chapter 2, verse 13. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep one's, oneself from being polluted by the world. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith? and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him. But you have dishonoured the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbour as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favouritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Great, let's pray, and then we'll think about those words together. Our Father in heaven, we do pray that we would be those, uh, like James called his readers to be last week, who do not merely listen to the word, but do what it says. Father, these words will likely challenge us. And so, Father, we pray that by your Spirit, you will enable us to do what they say, out of love for our Saviour, who has redeemed us and brought us into his family. Amen. Well, one thing we love uh, as a church here at Woody Road uh, is welcoming new people into our midst. It might be this morning that you are new amongst us, either just kind of passing through, or it's your first Sunday here. We're genuinely delighted that you are here with us uh, this morning. It's a joy to have new people walk into our gatherings. And yet, as new people do walk in, as those who are regular here, we need to be honest with ourselves, I think. Because there are probably some types of people that we are more delighted about walking in than others. Those preferences will be different depending who we are. Some of us will tend towards preferring the younger over the older. Others rich over poor. Others will focus on those who have successful careers. Others will be more excited when a family walks in than a single person. And the list could go on and on and on. We do genuinely love welcoming people. We love new people joining us. But whenever anyone new walks in, a temptation comes. A temptation comes with the question, are we going to treat this person rightly? Or are we going to show favoritism to some who walk in in comparison to others? See, we're not the first Christians to ever face that temptation. We don't know very much at all, actually, about James's first hearers, those who heard this letter originally. We think it might well have been a circular letter, which meant it was kind of passed around from church to church. We do know that at least some of his hearers were tempted to show favoritism to some people over others, just like we are. 
And it seems that for them, their particular challenge when it came to showing favoritism was an instinctive favoring of the rich over the poor. James challenges that this morning. And in doing so, challenges any way in which we might consciously or subconsciously show favoritism to one group over another. This morning, James calls us to two types of treatment. One type we must avoid, and another that we must do. Here's the first type of treatment. The treatment to avoid, do not show favoritism, James says. That's where he starts in verse 1 of our passage. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, must not show favoritism. If you are here and you are a believer in Jesus, you have come to trust him as your Lord and Savior, you must not show favoritism. That's what James says. You are to not treat one person better than another. Just to caveat, what that doesn't mean is it doesn't mean that we have to kind of be equally friends with everyone in church, as if we kind of have to have these surface level relationships with everyone and we can't have deep friendships at all because it's impossible to maintain deep friendships with this number of people. That is not what James is saying. He's not saying there can't be some people whom, with whom you have a deeper friendship than you do with others. But he is saying we must not favor one type of person over another. We must not look down on some at the, at, and look up at others. And that really matters. Why? Because when we show favoritism, it undermines what God has done. You see, we are told two different times that God does not show favoritism. In the book of Acts, Peter says it. In the book of Romans, Paul says it. God does not show favoritism when it comes to salvation. Particularly in both those passages, it is saying that he treats both Jewish person and Gentile alike. Both are welcomed in. You see, when God chose who to save, he didn't show favoritism to a certain ethnicity or a certain wealth bracket or people of a certain class or people with a minimum IQ. In fact, not only does he not show favoritism, he inverts what we would expect him to do. Look at verse 5. Listen, my dear brothers and sisters. Has God not chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith? and to inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him. There's a risk of overstating what this verse is saying, and some people do say that. Some people kind of read this verse and go, okay, well, that means that rich people are excluded from God's kingdom. We know that can't be true. I mean, for a start, someone like Lydia, who comes to faith in the book of Acts, she is rich. It isn't that God doesn't choose rich people as well. The point of this verse is to be inclusive, not exclusive. I say, God does not exclude the poor. God welcomes them in. He chooses them to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom. The point is, he doesn't choose the people we would choose. If you were kind of planning who you would choose, I wonder who would make your list. Those who are wealthy, those who are impressive, those who've got lots to contribute. That's the kind of group that most people in the world would pick for anything, isn't it? Just think of the school sports game. Who do people pick first? Those who can contribute the most. That is not how God chooses people. God does not show favoritism. And yet, it seems like some of James's hearers, those who have received favor from God, not based on what they have to offer, some of those hearers are showing favoritism to others in their midst. And so in verses 2 to 3, James tells us a story. This story may or may not be based on a real event, we don't know. But I want you to kind of glance down at verses 2 and 3 and then let your imaginations run wild and bring that story into Woody Road in the 21st century. So here it goes. Next Sunday, two new believers join us for the first time. Okay, it's 10.25. People are starting to filter in. And in walks a very well-dressed man, crisp shirt. It's either new or very freshly ironed. He's got a signet ring on his left pinky. He's got smart brown shoes that are impeccably polished. He looks like he probably lives in one of those giant houses along the Woodstock Road. He takes a seat. 
on time, ready for the service. Around 15 minutes later, it's 10.40 now. Church is well underway. Uh, We've just finished singing a couple of opening songs, praising the Lord for who he is and what he's done. And then a noise comes from the back. We're trying to focus, and yet this noise is distracting us. We turn around. Another man has walked in. First, we notice the noise because he is coughing and spluttering loudly. Then we notice the clothes and the smell. He looks like he's been sleeping rough for a while. He's a believer. As much as you can, I want you to be honest with yourself for a moment. Would your mental reaction to those two people be the same? Would you be equally pleased that both are present? Would you be equally eager to welcome both after? In James's narrative, that isn't what happens. One is shown preferential treatment as a, compared to another, given a special seat of honor, while the other one is told to sit at someone's feet. The poor man looked down on the rich elevated. And James's response, verse 4, is scathing. If you do that, you have discriminated among yourselves. You have become judges with evil thoughts. Because you thought of some people better than others. You've put yourself in a seat of judgment. You've decided that person is worthy of honor, and that person isn't, even though God has shown both of them honor by bringing them into his kingdom. Now, let's be realistic for a moment. It's pretty unlikely that we would be quite so explicit about it, partly because we don't have seats of honor, particularly. But do those temptations ever exist in our hearts? Whether it's rich against poor, or whether it's another distinction. The danger for all of us, I think, isn't it? There is a danger that each of us instinctively prefers, shows favoritism to one group over another. And I think part of the reason that that happens is actually because of what James says directly before these verses. This is why I got Janet to read a couple of verses from the end of chapter 1. What's the last thing James says before launching into speaking about favoritism? Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. And then he goes on to speak about favoritism. Why? Well, I wonder whether it's possibly because James recognizes that one of the major ways in which we can be polluted by the world's thinking is in this area. This area of how we value others, how we think about others. This is one of the major ways in which our thinking can become sub-Christian. One of the ways in which we're more shaped by the voices that surround us than the implanted word within us. Here's a little challenge for you. I want you to try and think in your heads one word to summarize how our culture today assigns value to people. 20 seconds in your head. One word, how our culture today assigns value to people. I wonder what word you came up with. As I was pondering that earlier this week, I think probably the best answer that I could come up with, at least, is something like utility or ability. That is, we assign value based on what someone can do. That is our basic cultural mindset. People's value is tied to what they can do or achieve. It's fascinating. I was in the car chatting to someone earlier this week, and he was telling me about a time where he went to a different country for three months. Uh, At the time, he was kind of unemployed in the UK, and he was a bit worried about how people in that country would view the fact that he was unemployed. So he rang his friend out there who he was going to stay with, and he said, how do I explain to people what I do with my time? And this guy just laughed down the phone at him. He didn't understand why. He spent three months out there. Well, a single person asked him what he did. To work, and yet it's like the first or second thing we ask someone, isn't it? Name, what do you do? Why? 
Why is that? It is because, as a culture, we instinctively try and tie people's value to what they do, and so we need to know what they do so that we can work out where to place them on a ladder. What does that mean in our culture? The able valued over the disabled. The academically intelligent valued over those who are less intelligent. The strong valued over the weak. The young valued over the old. The healthy valued over the sick. The skilled over the unskilled. The rich over the poor. And the list could go on and on and on. And yet, the word implanted in us says exactly the opposite to what our culture around us says. It says value, worth, and dignity for every human being comes not from our ability. It comes not from our utility, not from what we can do. Because God bestows his image on everyone equally. And then within the church, even more so, because he chooses people not based on what they can do, from the fact that he has chosen them because he has set his love on them. What business have we showing favoritism when God doesn't do that with people? And yet, within the church, there is this temptation. There is always this temptation because the world will pollute our thinking. It is so easy to fall into that trap. And it's probably even easier to fall into that trap, given where we are. We live in a city renowned for attracting the best of the best. Some of the world's best people come here whether to work or to study. And so this city's reputation thrives off the mindset that ability equals value. That's what makes Oxford tick. Are we so sure we haven't slipped into that thinking at all? It's easy to fall into that way of thinking within the church, impressed by the person who walks in and says, oh yeah, I'm just starting my default in theology. Excited about the new student who seems to bring so many gifts to the life of the church. Wowed by those who walk in with impressive sounding jobs. Those kind of people can get more of our attention, can't they? Are they more worth us investing our energy into, maybe? Especially as they'll probably make a more concrete, positive impact in the life of the church, won't they? On the church rotors, on the church finances as they bring their skills to the music group, perhaps? Is it that those are the kind of people we are keener to settle in? Are those the kind of people that we really want to stay? Are those the kind of people we prioritize sitting with at lunch after church? Are those the kind of people we prioritize having round to our house for a meal? Are those the kind of people who, when they turn up once as they're touring the churches in Oxford and don't turn up again, we're sadder that they didn't choose to stay here? Because we will miss out on what they could have done. Now, hey, it's right to welcome people well. What James does not say is do not welcome the impressive in your midst. But he does say don't do it at the expense of the less impressive. Those who come in, and their life is a mess. Those who come in and we think, I cannot possibly see how they're going to be a net benefit to us. They're just going to be a drain on time and resources. James says, do not show favoritism. If there is even a slight danger that our hearts might be tempted to do that, we need to hear James's warning. Showing favoritism, James says, is wrong. Because it is judging by the standards of this world. It is double-mindedness, saying that God is the center and the most important thing, and yet living a little bit like the world. Many of those God has chosen are poor in the world's eyes, and yet they're made rich in faith. They will inherit the kingdom. And yet we so quickly favor some over others. God doesn't. And so when we do that, we dishonor those whom God has honored. James's call is simple. Do not show favoritism. God doesn't. So what business have you doing so? What's going to help each of us do that? Because that is a hard call. That is a challenging thing to actually live out in practice. 
I think one of the things that will help us, and that's helped me as I've been prepping this week, is remembering which of the two men we are like before God. James told a story about two men, one who walked in in fine, impressive clothing, one who walked in, a poor man in filthy old clothes. Which one are we like before God? Here's what Isaiah tells us. All our righteous acts are like filthy rags. When it comes to approaching God, we are not the rich man. Even our best deeds, like filthy rags before him, tainted. And yet, how does he respond to us? He sent his son to die so that he welcomes us in with open arms. If you're here this morning and you're a Christian, you are like that second man, poor, in filthy old clothes before God, and yet he has welcomed you in. That is what is going to motivate us to do that to others. It's worth saying as I look around Woody Road and like kind of wade up this over the course of this week, I don't think this is something that is kind of a major issue. It's not that I picked to preach on the book of James because I think you guys are such favoritists. I'm really encouraged by what I see, the Lord's work in people moving towards others. People are welcomed in, interacted with, cared for, regardless of who they are, both here and at coffee shop on a Tuesday and in other places as well. And yet with God's help, we can grow in this, can't we? Because we're not perfect when it comes to not showing favoritism. We're not perfect in choosing who we talk to. Often we choose who we talk to based on our preferences, not on the need of others. James calls us this morning to not show favoritism. But James calls us this morning not just to a kind of a, a negative to avoid. He also calls us to a positive to exhibit. Here's the second type of treatment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Because that's the opposite to favoritism. Two types of treatment, favoritism and love. And the question is, which will you choose? Jesus was asked, uh, what's the greatest commandment? Famously. What did he say? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And he was sneaking, snuck a second one in as well. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, we've probably heard that so many times. We're so used to that 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 seems really obvious to us. Of course, that's the, the two greatest commands, Jesus. One towards God and one towards others. Here's the thing. That wasn't obvious to Jesus' first hearers. The first half was... Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's right out of Deuteronomy 6. That is one of the most famous parts of the Old Testament. That is the kind of part of the Old Testament that Jewish children would probably be required to memorize. They knew that they were meant to love the Lord their God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. It's the second one that would have caught them out. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's actually quite an obscure commandment in the Old Testament. I wonder if you know where it comes from without looking at the footnotes in your Bible comes from the book of Leviticus. It comes from a chapter in Leviticus where the helpful NIV title is Various Laws. But to be fair, it's a pretty accurate description because it seems like a hodgepodge of various laws. Now, I think there's more than that going on, and if we ever preach through Leviticus, I will kind of see that when we're there. Love your neighbor as yourself is followed by a verse that tells us three things. Don't mate different kinds of animals. Don't plant a field with two kinds of seeds. Don't wear clothing with two kinds of material. It's not a kind of big headline bit of the Old Testament. But it was obvious to Jesus. It was the one he picked out. Why? Because it encapsulates so much of the rest of it. So many of those commands, whether the command to not murder, the command to not commit adultery, the command to not covet, and on and on and on we could go, so many of those boil down to... Do you love your neighbor as yourself? Because what Jesus is telling us is he's asked those question, that question and he gives that answer. He's telling us it is not enough to love God. 
you also need to love like God. And it's not enough to love God, you also need to love like God. Which means genuinely loving your neighbour as yourself. That phrase, love your neighbour as yourself, seems to be a summary of a kind of section of Leviticus that James seems to draw upon. See, in Leviticus 19, we're not only told to love our neighbours as ourselves, we're also told this. Do not show partiality to the poor or favouritism to the great. That seems to be in James's mind, those verses, as he writes this section. So James says very clearly, favouritism is a sin. Why? Because it is not loving our neighbours as ourselves. And because it's a sin, committing it makes us lawbreakers. Look at verses 9 and 10 with me for a second. Let me read them. James says, if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. James's point is this. The law has two states, broken or unbroken. When it comes to our relationship with the law, those are the only two categories that exist. Breaker, not breaker. Not I've broken a little bit. Not I kind of did a minor offense. No, any one sin breaks the whole law, James says. That might seem pretty extreme. Is that an overreaction, James? Calm down a little bit, we think. Well, no, it's because of what sin is. And James shows us that in quite a subtle way. He shows us that sin is, the problem is not action, it is rebellion against the lawgiver. So verse 11 says, For he who said you shall not commit adultery also said you shall not murder. It's interesting what James didn't write. He didn't write for the law that states also states. So it's not kind of saying the law says this and the law says this. If you break one part, you break the law. No, he says he who said also said. That is the issue with breaking the law is that we are rejecting the lawgiver. It is not that we're kind of, we got one deed a bit wrong. It is our attitude towards the one who gives the law that is the problem. So every time we sin, when we break laws like showing favoritism, when we do not love our neighbor as ourselves, it shows that it is a rejection of the lawgiver. So James tells us, verse 8, love your neighbor as yourself. If you do, you are doing right. But if not, you are rejecting the lawgiver, and that is a serious thing. So verses 12 and 13. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. There's some complex words, there's some intricate ideas in there. But here's the point. Rather than being judges with evil thoughts, like James accuses his hearers of in verse 4, rather than being lawbreakers who reject the lawgiver like he shows us we are in verses 8 to 11, we are called to be those who speak and act as those who will one day be accountable to the lawgiver. James tells us that those who do not show mercy to others, those who do not love others, will face merciless judgment. And yet the last four words are wonderful, aren't they? Mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And that is most true in God himself. See, for all who come to him, that is a promise to cling on to. Mercy triumphs over judgment. If you've been convicted of the ways that you show favoritism towards others, come to Christ. Come back to him. Repent of that. And remember that mercy triumphs over judgment. So we're called to show mercy to others. God is rich in mercy. God is so merciful that he sent his own son into the world. His own son perfectly kept the law, and yet he was judged by the law. 
He took the penalty for breaking the law so that lawbreakers can receive mercy. Jesus died to save people. He died to save the rich. He died to save the poor. He died to pay the penalty for our favoritism. He died to pay the penalty for the way that we have lacked love for our neighbors. As those saved by, saved from the penalty of the law by Jesus' death, we are called to live out these commands. We are called to love our neighbors as ourselves. Because it is not enough to love God. We are also to love like him. And that means loving our neighbors as ourselves. James this morning has highlighted for us two different types of treatment. A treatment to avoid favoritism. A treatment to live out, loving our neighbors as ourselves. As we close, I want you to imagine what Woodbury Road might look like if we embody more of the treatment to live out than the one to avoid. So I want you to imagine that next Sunday, those two people we imagined earlier do actually walk in. The wealthy man at 10.25, the shabby-looking man at 10.40. Instead, I want you to imagine that both of them feel warmly welcomed. Both of them find that people move towards them in love. Neither one is left alone. Neither one is ignored. Neither one is favored. Neither one is prioritized. Both of them receive invitations round to someone's house for a meal later that week. They're both believers in Jesus already, and they are struck afresh. There is something different about God's people, isn't there? And it draws them back to the God who saved them. The God who didn't show favoritism to, uh, kind of against them. The God who welcomed them in with open arms. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing to embody as a church family? Isn't that something that you long to be more and more the case for us as a group of believers? If it is something you long for, remember it won't happen naturally. Because naturally we are polluted by the world. We often slip into worldly ways of thinking. So we need to come back to what James reminded us in chapter 1, that we are to humbly accept the word that has been planted in us. We need to listen more to the word within us than the voices that surround us. So today, with God's help, let's strive to not show favoritism. Let's instead strive to love our neighbors as ourselves. Let me lead us in prayer. Father in heaven, these are hard-hitting words because they expose something of the sinfulness and favoritism in our hearts. The ways in which we naturally move towards some people and naturally either move away from or don't move towards others. Father, we recognize that the favoritisms we show will be different for each of us, but Father, we pray that you would, by your Spirit, help us to move towards everyone. Father, please, would we not show favoritism? Would this be a group of people who are not marked by showing favoritism, but are instead marked by loving our neighbors as ourselves as we remember how you have loved us and sent your Son to die for us? We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.